Greetings from Lenoxville, Quebec, where I'm coming to you live from the Bishops University campus and my backyard here on campus. Uh, my name is Dan Seneker. I'm the Director of Student Recruitment and Retention here at Bishops, as well as an alumnus from the class of 1994. So welcome to another episode of our co-video isolation series. And today I'd like to welcome back Dr. Jamie Crooks, professor in our philosophy department. Last time Jamie and I spoke about, uh, or Jamie spoke about uh, the role of humanities during the crisis. And uh, that was a lot of fun. So today we thought we'd uh, do it again, but do a little different topic and have more fun. Uh, today we're gonna talk about how music inspires and in particular about a certain band called the Beatles and their influence on our lives as well as multiple generations. So welcome back, Jamie. Thanks for joining me today. Dan, great to be here, man. And I, I, I'm absolutely delighted to be here talking about the Beatles. <laughs> there you go. You know? A little easier topic than last time. Uh, you know, the stress levels are much, much lower than they were mm -hmm. uh, before. Absolutely. Sure. And this is kind of fitting because it's the 50th anniversary of the breakup of the Beatles. Unbelievable. Yeah, eh? 50 years. So. I mean, I can't believe I've lived that long, let alone it's been that long since they, they mm -hmm. broke up. And maybe we can start there because it's a little different for the two of us because um, the Beatles had already broken up by the time I was born and uh, you're about 13 years older than me. So you right. went through most of the iteration of the Beatles. Um, so let's start there. Maybe what's your earliest memory of the Beatles or how did you, how do you remember being introduced to the Beatles? So, um, when I was four years old, okay. I lived in a small town in Ontario called Cardinal, Cardinal, Ontario. Yeah, in uh, eastern Ontario. Eastern Ontario, right right along the seaway. There was a canal that ran through the back mm -hmm. of the town at that point and so on. And um, my house, uh, I, ha I had a fairly big back backyard in my house with a fence dividing my house from the house that was on the other street okay so we had the two backyards were together and i used to have conversations with a girl who lived in the other house who was five years old and so much older and more sophisticated than <laughs> i was and uh and one day we were talking at the fence and uh she said you know there's this band the beatles and they're from britain and uh, i know all their songs and so forth and, and i can remember saying the beatles what? what kind of stupid name is is that yeah. at which point she got very mad at me and marched back into her house so that's my earliest mem wow. memory of the beatles i and you know what i always what always comes back to me about it was in my four-year-old way i i gotta be more careful what i say to people you know that that is welded to my okay. first memory of the beatles i yeah. can say yeah very cool yeah and so all right, so as a four-year-old, you uh, were introduced to them, but when did you really get to know them? Yeah, good question. So the next really clear memory I have of them is uh, anticipating their appearance on the Ed Sullivan mm. show, but not the one that everybody thinks about okay. where the not 1963. girls are there and they're singing, I want to hold your hand and all that sort of thing, but they came back onto the Ed Sullivan show in I'm going to say late in the 60s, probably 69, something like that. Okay. And at that, it, you know, at, in 1969, I'm, you know, nine or 10 years old, depending on when it is in that year. And um, uh, not a very sophisticated watcher of TV. So uh, as it turns out, what Ed Sullivan did was just show a film of the Beatles oh. that ended up being part of the movie that they were to make later on called let it be um but in that film but but it all seemed to me like part of the same show as a kid is what okay. i'm saying so ed sullivan says the beatles and then they play let it be let it be so imagine i don't know if you have a clear memory of this but imagine the first time you've ever heard that song okay. mccartney has the best like at that point had the best voice in pop music right you know as a little kid singing songs every day and so on i was like oh i want that voice yeah. you know that's the voice that that you tried to emulate that i tried to emulate. you know i think most people who sing try to model themselves yeah, after sure. somebody for me it's definitely okay yeah so yeah so i guess i i know the answer to the question but i have to ask 
uh, Paul, George, Ringo, or John? Well, it's going to be Paul for me. And the reason is because like many little kids, I took piano lessons. Yeah. And Paul was, I, both Paul and John played the piano, but Paul was the main piano player in the Beatles. So I was like, oh, I got to learn how to play Let It Be. I got to learn how to play Hey Jude. I got to learn how to yeah. play Lady Madonna and all of those piano licks that you okay. always hear him play. Yeah. And so that was it. it was that the, was it. It was the piano. So, yeah. so sorry, did you say that you were a piano player first? Or because of Paul, you that was the inspiration to start learning no, piano? No, I, I mean, I was already a piano player, okay. but a little kid, you yeah. know. I mean, I started piano when I was four years old, like lots of other little kids do, and, mm -hmm. and followed it for, actually, in my case, 20 years or something like right. that. But, but um, always, always kind of being distracted from classical piano by the Paul McCartney's and the Elton John's of the world. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what about you though? Like what about like, me? What's your earliest memory of the Beatles? Yeah. So I, I wasn't, they were done. Again, yeah. But my earliest recollection um, or where I really kind of noticed them was grade 10 art class. Shout out to Mr. Percy Payette, um, <laughs> where we did a, a section on subliminal messaging and advertising and marketing. Okay. And so we talked about like Joe Camel and, and cigarette ads and Disney and everything. But then we brought, it was about the art. And so it was the album cover of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. And the whole Paul is dead um, kind of thing that happened where, where they were saying that uh, Paul was in this accident, in a car accident, and he was dead, and they were using an imposter, and they created this, um, this album cover that kind of showed them the Fab Four in their mop top days with their black suits and everything, kind of mournfully looking over this grave, and uh, then the four guys were um, in their Sgt. Pepper's outfits, and Paul was like straightforward, the other guys were kind of on an angle right. and then right across the um, the drum was Lonely Hearts. And they said, you know, if you, if you take a mirror and you cut it in half, it says one, he died and the A points towards Paul. Right. And so that just captivated me. And I was like, wow, that is just insane. Like, do you know how much talk there was about those rumors in the 60s? It was unbelievable. And, and people also said they were subliminal messages yeah. in the songs if you Play played them backwards. backwards. So people were always trying to figure out, it was record players in those mm -hmm. days, of course, and people were always trying to figure out, how can I play this backwards yeah. and find out the truth about what's going exactly. on? Exactly. So, the original conspiracy <laughs> yeah, theories, that's right. right? Like it, it's yeah. very and, and, it, and it built right through to like Abbey Road and uh, yes. some of the other albums. Yeah. And um, So that was my introduction. So I didn't, for me, it wasn't, the music that got me first it was the art and the whole idea of the the marketing and the subliminal right. messaging right. and then not until not until i became a student at bishops um back in the early 90s did it was i introduced to the beatles in conjunction with eric clapton and led zeppelin and uh the who and rolling stones and everything so i kind of learned about them and listened to some of the music and it was never the first stage of their career that that was of interest to me so yeah. the love me do hold my hand twist right. and shout that was 50s rock that i wasn't really interested in yeah, it yeah. was kind of the um well rubber soul and revolver albums and beyond that was like okay wow yeah I'm, I'm i'm really i'm really intrigued with this style of music and then they go into the um the psychedelic phase and the influences from their visits and trips to India and and then later on in life when I got to appreciate really the music and and how just versatile they are right and how enduring the music is and kind of going waves I mean but, when, when you think think about it now like I often think about the Rolling Stones mm -hmm. who of course never broke up yeah <laughs> you know, like, you know 50 years ago they were a group and 50 and and now they're still a group mm -hmm. and for years i was kind of um offended by that i thought oh why don't you get off the stage and let younger people take over and now they're so old that i'm behind them 100 percent. i'm like can you go till Keep you're going. 90 like yeah. it's amazing um but think that that all of the things that you mentioned like the the, the 50s era you know, those early experiments with that. And then all of the 
stuff on Rubber Soul and Revolver and Sgt. Peppers and the White Album mm -hmm. and Hey Jude and Abbey Road happens in a seven year period. That's the piece that isn't that amazing that blew my but, mind. Like, um, you know, I will admit that I did a little research before we got together because I was worried that you were going to blow me out of the water. Well, you don't that. have to be ashamed about that. <laughs> so I, I, but it that was the thing that really caught me off guard was like they only recorded for like seven or eight years. Like in my mind, I had thought that they were like this 15, 20 year legacy right, right. that had been going on forever. Because when you yeah. think about their repertoire of songs and albums and everything and how enduring they are, you're like, there's no way that you did this in eight years. Yeah. Like compared eight, to, you're, seven or eight, seven years, or eight years. Yeah. Know. And then compared to the Rolling Stones, they've yeah. been around for 50 years. Um, As I say, I'm not against the Rolling Stones in any way, but my goodness, the accomplishment, like the, the songbook, we, we were talking earlier, I, you know, fulfilled one of my lifelong dreams in 2009, I saw Paul McCartney play in Halifax, okay. and uh, the songbook that he has access to, like he can come out and give a three and a half hour concert that consists of nothing but number one hits. That's basically. right. It's unbelievable. Yep. And uh, some of those are Wings uh, tunes, mm -hmm. and Wings have some great tunes. But I'm going to say, you know, like if he if he plays 40 songs, 25 of those songs are Beatles songs. No, at least, yeah. Right. They, they, which means they all come from that seven-year period. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's incredible. Uh, you know, they have... So there's a website that I was looking at that ranks from best to worst or from worst to best. There are 213 songs that they recorded. Okay. And you start going through and you get to about mm, around 150 to 100. Right. And you're like, there's some big name songs in there that you're like, okay, like not everybody likes Oba Di Oba Da or whatever oh, I like love that. It, but um, it's in there. Yeah. In in like 125 or something like that. And you're like, oh, that's way better than that. But then yeah. when you start going scrolling down the list, you're like, oh yeah, this song, this song, this song, and and you see like, it's just amazing. Well, like, I gotta, I can't help but ask you this question. What's number one? I haven't got there yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was, I was, oh, okay, okay. I was flipping through, but I got so oh, that's funny. I got so caught up with, oh wow, this song, and then I start playing it and everything like that. That I'm like right. at number 80 or something like that. Oh, so okay. I still don't know what the number one song is. Oh, my but. God, I can't even what would be your number one song? Oh, that's that's I I'm so unhappy that you asked me that question. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's impossible. A tough one. What I mean, uh, a version of that question would be: What's the song I played the most in my life? Either mm -hmm. in the sense of playing the recording or trying to play it myself on the piano and sing it. Probably "Hey Jude." Okay. I would say if if we're going to take that measure. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, man. There's like there's just so many, yeah, so many good ones that are that are linked to so many moments in my life. It's it's really, you know what I'm gonna put in a plug for? Okay. Golden Slumbers. If you had to pick one album, let's say, so a song is harder, but one album. What was the the album that did it for you? I think the album that I listened to the most probably is Abbey Road. Okay. And I mean, they did something extraordinarily well. I mean. I could say that about five different albums of there. You'd say that about Sgt. Pepper's and the White Album, too. But on, on the second side of Abbey Road, you have this uh, medley that starts about two songs in and then goes for 25 minutes where they just keep morphing into different songs. And Golden Slumbers is part of that, right? Okay. And so that's a kind of concept of a song or a collection of songs that, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be tripped up by real historians of the 1960s but i don't remember anybody else doing that before the beatles did it mm -hmm. yeah. so that's probably my what about you i think for for listening pleasure i think it's the white album right but i think that the one i keep on going back to that really introduced me and and i started like really getting into the band was probably rubber soul just because it was kind of making that transition from them what i what I classify as their, you know, early teeny pop days, right. like bubblegum rock, yeah, bubblegum yeah. pop, yeah, yeah, yeah. to to more mature sound. Yeah, I think that's right. And like there were a few songs like Eight Days a Week and everything. We're, we're getting there, but and then kind of rubble, rubble, rubber soul and revolver 
kind of brought them into the music that I really enjoyed and yeah. more of that, um, the rock and the ballads and the things that I keep on going back to. Like I never listened to Twist and Shout. And, yeah. Um, like, and we did a little test beforehand on Alexa to say, you know, play the Beatles. And the first song that came up was Twist and Shout. Right. Which uh, I think for a lot of people that was their first memory of the Beatles and that's how they were introduced to North America. Um, but for me, that stuff doesn't, doesn't interest me. I mean, let me just say something about the white album. Sure. Because that's a really interesting project too, right? So, uh, you and I were talking earlier about Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene near the end of that play where there's a play within a play, which happens a couple of times in Shakespeare actually. But in this particular case, it's a kind of comic version of Romeo and Juliet with working class guys playing all the parts, including the Juliet part. Yeah. And it's supposed to be ridiculous. And it, and it is ridiculous. I mean, people, uh, it's a hilarious scene that people laugh at when these guys do this, you know, supposedly serious romantic play. But there's a point in it where the romantic hero dies. And all of a sudden, that joke becomes dead serious. And I remember watching that in a production of this that I was involved in that actually included Beatles music and, and thinking to myself, oh my God, Shakespeare can do anything. <laughs> like he can take you from the absurd to the heart rending in about 30 seconds. Like what an amazing accomplishment that is. And when I look at the White Album, I think something like that, right? Like it's the Beatles are at the absolute height of their power. They're like, we can do any genre of music yeah. and pull it off. Like, so think of the song, Your Mother Should Know. Do you so that song could have come from the 20s or 30s, yeah. right? It's as if they're saying, we can take any genre of music, burrow into it, and make something out of it. Mm -hmm. And so I think really, like, a part of their genius is that. They don't... Um, they don't reject the past. The past is always material for their creative activity. And the White Album might be the high point of that. Yeah. So would you say that's one of the reasons why they are so enduring? Would you say that it's because they are so versatile and they transcend genres and time? Well, uh, now that you've <laughs> made that excellent point yes i'll i'll <laughs> sign on. her <laughs> yeah i mean that but like doesn't that sound right though i mean one of the astounding things is that you know we mark the 50th anniversary of them breaking up and people almost everybody still knows who they are still knows their songs and so on and i one of the things i was asking myself uh you know as i was thinking about our talk today was if I go back to 1970, what from 1920 am I listening to or wow. is in my world in any way? And the answer is absolutely nothing. So the, uh, the accomplishment is astounding. So then you have to ask yourself, why have they endured so long? And I think your question contains part of the answer, which is um, they simply cannibalize all the styles of music. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, the, you know, they keep saving things. They, they're a kind of repository for the whole, um, the whole history of 20th century music in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's true. And you can, you can hear um, pieces of the songs that have kind of been replicated now. So, like, when I'm listening to that song, Your Mother Should Know, I'm like, ooh, okay, there's elements of, like, Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody in there, right? right? That's and, true. and then you have, like, yeah. uh, my guitar gently weeps, and you yeah. had, like, Jeff Healy and others replicate it. And, Absolutely. Um, uh, so many different songs where they've taken, where I hear a few chords, I'm like, oh, that sounds a lot like such and such a song that's being played now. And, so true. Yeah, so yeah. it's uh, really interesting. So maybe, um, maybe I'll ask you one last question. Okay. So... What is the one song that you find yourself maybe humming in your in your head or singing um, that kind of keeps on coming back? That you're you know find yourself maybe humming humming the tune or singing the song or or wanting to sing. I uh, oh, that's a good question. I I think 
almost no day goes by where I don't have some snippet of Blackbird mm. in my head. You know, that is certainly, you can hear these bird sounds even <laughs> in the backyard here, you know, that's, and I live on a farm, so of course I hear them all the time. So it's Blackbird. That comes to me quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and does that hold any sort of significant message to you or anything like that? I love the, uh, the line, you were only waiting for this moment to arise. Uh, I, I think that's a beautiful, beautiful um, thought uh, and it's beautifully expressed. <laughs> Blackbird singing in the dead of night Take these broken wings and learn to fly All your life You were only waiting for this moment to arrive Blackbird singing in the dead of night Take these sunken eyes and learn to see All your life You were only waiting for this moment to be free Blackbird fly Blackbird fly Into the light of a dark black night Moment to arrive. 